G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Well, I went down to the shed today to have a look at a bit of science I had running down there and I found this. These animals are just so dumb. Have you ever seen anything that has so much irony and so much dumb all in one place? I mean, how dumb do you have to be to be so ironically coming back for more of the very thing that's going to do you in? Anyway, here's Nathan and Anthony. So and the proof reversal fallacy, proof correct. Reversal. Because it isn't for us to prove anything unless we uh, unless we make claims. So we're not really making claims. No one claims that the AE map is actually a map. We're just saying it's a depiction, a description, a, a, an idea to get your head around the basic concept, right? It's not being touted as a map. Oh, I just love this part. It's the whole just saying it's flat regime, isn't it? So Nathan, he's going to say the world is flat, but he doesn't want to provide a model. He's oh, I don't have to provide a model. I'm just saying it's flat. Look, like Wolfie's been saying around the water cooler for a long time. The flatties have actually all totally given up. Or oh, bar dim dim, but he's too dim dim to know that he can't do it. And this is my globe. Everyone's pretty much given up trying to produce a model. A flat model, that is, because they know they can't. They just, and any time they do, they just get themselves in a big pile of trouble. So, Nathan, if quite wisely saying, no, we can't do it, and we don't have to do it, and I'm not going to do it, and you can't make me do it. You complete clown! Hang on a sec. If, if you go to so, Google and just type in, um, all maps are wrong, you will find umpteen references that tell you that all the maps are wrong. Because no matter how you project it, no matter how you describe it, draw it, calculate it, scale it, no matter what you do, you can't get it to be accurate for some reason. And they always say it's because you can't wrap a ball around on a, on a plane, right? So the piece of paper that you're drawing it on or the screen, you can't wrap a sphere around it. And that's what they say. However, the fact is that all the maps that he claimed that he thinks are right in the first place are openly admitted to be wrong anyway because of the way they're presented. Well, then, Anthony, I guess the thing is here, when he says that they're inaccurate, what he's saying is that they all have various distortions because, well, as you quite rightly say, <coughs> I don't want to say that you've got something right, but you quite rightly say you can't project from a round 3D shape and put it on a square flap 2D shape without some distortion somewhere. But you know what does actually work quite well? A globe. Just get a ball and project the ball onto a ball. Quite easy. The guy's a moron. He's asserting the Earth is this sphere-shaped model. Reification. But I'd like to see it. I want to see oh. the model he's claiming. I want to actually see it. Oh, you guys really crack me up. You think there is no spherical model and no one's provided it. Look, guys, I mean, even Neil deGrasse Tyson, where he's saying that the Earth is an oblate spheroid, would get um actually by these guys at Esri. These guys understand the geoid to within a metre. From 6,300 plus kilometres, these guys know it down to the metre. And even in the oceans, they've worked out where the gravitational anomalies are. They can even spot where the undulations in the oceans are. I'll leave the link in the description for this really interesting article by Esri. These guys really, really know their stuff. And I can just imagine how much they'd be laughing at you guys. So, Anthony, where's your flatoid? Where's all your deviations based on the flatness of the uh, disk? Oh, yeah, that's right. You haven't even worked out how to use the P900 and the compass to determine the shape yet, have you? The guy's a moron. I mean, there are geodetists, there is geodetic surveyors. There's so many people who have dedicated their whole professional career into knowing exactly how high the ocean levels are, the exact shape of the Earth. For goodness sake, guys, there was a whole satellite launched. The whole purpose of the satellite was to accurately map the altitudes of all land masses and water around the world. None of these guys know what science is, but everybody wants that comforting lie. That's why they can spew any nonsense and all the subs will just work, lap it up like cats lapping up milk because they want to believe the inconvenient truth, the inconvenient lie. That's what they want. All they're doing is playing up to the drongles of society and we're encouraging it by not pointing it out. We should be pointing it out every minute. Sorry, I'm done. Oh, that is just a brilliant little piece of wordage there by Anthony. And it is absolutely full of irony. And it really is flat earth in a nutshell. They really, really, really want to believe. So much so that no one ever bothers to pick up anybody else when they say something stupid, provided they're saying it looks flat to me. The other thing is, Nathan, the fourth element to it is when this claim of make, up, make your own model up comes up, realistically speaking, what can you expect from us when the current 
rhetoric has all of the science, so-called science, people, resources, tools, equipment, infrastructure, financial support, time, um, and the ability to do the cartography required to make a map. And they admit that they can't even get it accurate, right? What would you expect from our side when the most that we've got is a P900 and a compass? Oh, Anthony, that's called Crimea River fallacy, that one. Do you know what you can do with just a P900 and a compass? You can actually prove that the Earth is a globe. Here, let me give you a quick teaser of how I did it to show that guy exactly how the Earth is a globe. The guy's a moron. So the let's see it. Is... If we're going to have a, a, an yeah, argument yeah, no, about no. models and their accuracy, not that we hold true to one, we're not asserting any models, but as he is, I want to see it. Oh, Nathan, that's called being a wuss fallacy. You've got to make a claim, guys. Make a claim. If you're trying to claim something, you've got to make a claim. The thing is that most science-based people can, from what you say happens, easily work out what the model has to roughly look like. Do we have to do all the work for you? If you say the sun is circling overhead and the ground is flat, then you've got to have something that's basically like an AE map. And that then opens you up to all of the many, many, many problems that the AE map has. The guy's a moron. <laughs> It goes red. <laughs> there you go. I've said something about the lunar eclipse. I make no claims about it. I've, I've witnessed one and filmed it. It got very, very cold when it, when it went to totality. Oh, hold on there, Nathan. Isn't the moon supposed to make you cold? And the moonlight's gone away and you got cold. You're doing exactly the opposite. Nathan, you haven't read up on what you're supposed to believe. You're supposed to be getting hot when the moon goes away. The guy's a moron. You, okay, let's just address What's this quickly. Okay, no worries. We need to look at angular size resolution limits based on matches of the camera or objects of the telescope in this travel. The telescope has an angular resolution limit. You can calculate this limit with radio criteria. Things get smaller as they get further away. At a thousand miles, things get too small to see. What I would recommend for Professor Dave, go and watch a little excerpt from a series called Father Ted, where it's explained that the toy cow close to you is small, but the cow that's full size in distance on the hill is nearly far away. Now this is called perspective. If you're trying to look at New York or England, it's too small to see. The angle is too limited. Now given that this guy professes to be a professor, I would think you would understand that things get smaller as you get further away from them. And a thousand miles is far too far to resolve things. Their angle is too small. So I'll just declare it right here, right now. Pure stupidity on account of Professor Dave. Do you understand that things get smaller as they get further away? Oh, I know why he thinks this way. Because his model is based in geometry. And his model would use actual sizes for things in the distance. For example, if you were to ask him how much of whatever the hell is on the horizon is being obscured, he would tell you in feet and inches or meters how big this item is and how much it's blocked. However, these items at a thousand miles will still be the exact same feet and inches value precisely as his model calculates for. Now that would mean his globe model and his mathematics ignores perspective. And because his model of a globe Earth ignores perspective, he expects us to express the same exact fuck and assume that we can see things at a thousand miles. No, it's only your model that excludes the angle of things getting smaller as they get further away. Why on earth would the failings of your heliocentric model and its complete lack of angular size reduction be somehow transferable onto us as flat earth as being able to see things when you remove the hijacking of this perspective effect, which you called Earth curve in your perspective exclusive maths? You complete clown. So, Professor Dave, would you expect the angular resolution to be conformed to seeing things at a thousand miles? How big would something have to be angular size to see it at a thousand miles on any shaped surface? You complete clown. Then, when you answer all those questions, explain why the hell your geometric maths excludes perspective and for some reason completely ignores the fact that these things are very small in the distance. You'll give me that size in feet and inches, won't you? You complete clown. Tell us that you think things stay the same size at any distance because the feet and inches change in your globe maths. Yeah, they do. Their angular size, also known as apparent size, gets smaller distance. Funny coincidence, Professor Dave. People think it's all about how apparent things at the moment, not realizing, like you, that their calculations for a sphere of rotation fallacy utilizes actual sizes rather than apparent sizes. That would be the angular size, it gets small as it gets further away. Yeah, this would be a very big angular size if we were right next to it, but you'll still get the same feet and inches, and then ask us to just to see a thousand miles. You calculate your exclusive perspective, you complete moron. Take some flights. Yeah, um, I used to be an international rep. Yeah. I've traveled everywhere. There's, you, you'd struggle to find somewhere I haven't been. Take some flights. Yeah, every single flight I took, what I witnessed on the flights was endless numpties, rows and rows of them, with headphones on, listening to a shit series of radio channels and watching a crap television that you couldn't really watch with engine noise or trying to get to sleep or trying to get drunk or reading a magazine or book. That's what I witnessed. What I did on my flights when I flew all over the world, undoubtedly flew a lot more than Professor Dave will ever do in his entire lifetime, was I witnessed the flat plane below us. I also witnessed the horizon, which was claimed to be a physical sphere edge that should bend at the altitudes I was flying at, never bending, just seeing endless flat plane beneath me. Oh, Nathan, that is the old looks flat to me fallacy. I mean, how many people have looked out of a plane and just go, yeah, I can't see the curve? Seriously? You're going to try and pull that? Well, look, I tell you what. How about I show you a video and we'll get Wolfie to fly a plane and the independent variable can be the plane moving towards another plane. So we've got two planes, 40,000 feet and one 1,000 feet lower. So the independent variable is these two planes moving closer together. They're maintaining height, so Wolfie's twiggling the height by keeping it exactly the same. And let's just see what happens as Wolfie's plane flies 1,000 feet above the other plane. Now bear in mind, this is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and there's nothing else around but sky and water. Oh, and the sun out that um, right-hand window too, by the way. We'll get to that in a second. So as you can see, when the first plane is visible 25 nautical miles in front, 
It's well above the horizon, yet it's lower. Straight away we've busted the old horizon, always rises to eye level, haven't we? Right there. So now we can see that as the plane gets closer and closer, it actually dips underneath us. And it's now below the horizon, which geometrically it must do. Oh, and Nathan, now is the time to look out the right window and see that sunshine way over there, because now that's a really big thing and it's a long way away. We don't need Father Ted to tell us that's big and far away. You know how? Because when it moves from one side of the sky to the other, it never changes size by any significant amount. It's always roughly the same size. No cows on that one, mate. Give you complete moron. So if you want to go for a pissing competition, Professor Dave, I've taken a damn sight more flights than you ever will. Now, maybe there's other people out there like Wolfie, thank you very much indeed for supporting my uh, GoFundMe campaign, who've taken more flights than I have. And they might well lie to you about the horizon being a physical geometric edge that bends at altitudes that they don't achieve, and they claim not to be able to bend until you get higher, according to their priests like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, Nathan, that's the old Neil deGrasse Tyson fallacy. See, what happens there is you're cherry-picking Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're saying no curvature until you get to 120,000 feet, or some people say even at 120,000 feet you can't see curvature. If you're going to quote Neil, you've got to quote everything he says. You can't just cherry-pick the one thing that he says that suits you. Smacks of desperation. Give you complete moron! He did something scientific on this very panel. He got an egg, added a bit of mass to the medium, and it made the egg move. Now, if F equals MA and the A, the acceleration, was the egg moving, then there must have been a force there. Well, here's the thing. It went the opposite way to what your model would predict because if I add mass below the egg, that would attract the mass, wouldn't it, on your model? But it didn't do that. It pushed the egg away. So we have done an experiment scientifically. How hard do you think Professor Dave's going to laugh when he hears your little chicken and salted egg routine? Oh, Tony, Tony, Tony. Do you not understand eggs or salt water or anything? The biggest fail I'm getting a chuckle from here is you don't actually understand density. And I thought that's what you Muppets really understood was density or, sorry, relative density. That's all it is, relative density. So the salt has more sodium and chlorine added into the H2O and it makes it a denser solution. It's now more dense than the egg. So because of gravity, the water is now pulled in underneath the egg. The egg floats on top of it. It's a simple, come on, relative density. How do you guys not understand your own mantra? The guy's a moron. Well, that's enough muppetry for one day. Now, how shall I sign off today? Laser? No, probably not. I know, look, I was gonna go and do my guilty pleasure, which is go and drop in on Terry Davis. He does an excellent stream. It's running about now, so I might just drop in and say hello. And I see my good friend Terry Davis is gonna do a 400 sub celebration this afternoon, right when I plan to release this video. So everybody, please sub, and let's make this hilariously inaccurate for Terry. Poor guy, love you, man. Actually, I'll leave a link at the top, and I might drop this video right about when he's doing his next live thing. If you've never been to him, again, drop, drop in, subscribe. He's only got 400 subs at the moment, so I'm sure a few extras. And I'll, all they do is they sit around and watch videos and talk between the videos and just basically muck up and have a good old time. But when he has all the videos, he asks for people to provide a number and vote for what one you want to see next. I highly recommend four. Always go with four. That's my recommendation.